um, recording. All right. Welcome everyone again to the third edition of the Colorado Wildfires 2020 webinar series. Um, our first speaker is going to be Richard Thorpe. He moved for, to Fort Collins in 1997 to attend the Colorado State University. He completed his uh, bachelor's of science degree in fishery biology in 2001 and his master of science in entomology in 2006. Richard has been a surface water quality professional for more than 15 years, including time working as a research laboratory manager at CSU, as an environmental consultant and state surface water quality regular, regulatory agencies in both North Carolina and Wyoming. And Richard has served as the city of Fort Collins Utilities Watershed Program Manager Department um, since 2017. And our second speaker for this uh, third edition will be Mike Caggiano. Uh, he is a research scientist with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute at the Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. His most recent work focuses on cross-boundary spatial fire planning, prescribed fire capacity building, mapping the wildland urban in interface or WUI, and evaluating patterns of home loss in WUI disasters. He re received his BA from SUNY Geneseo, I'm sorry, uh, and, and his master's in geography from CUNY Hunter, and his uh, PhD in forest sciences from the Colorado State University. All right, that's enough for me. Uh, Richard, please take it away. Maybe so, see if I can get my presentation to go back. Ah, okay. Um, so thanks for that introduction um, and thanks for having me to present today. Again, my name is Richard Thorpe and I'm the Watershed Program Manager for City of Fort Collins Utilities. And the purpose of my presentation today is pretty much to, to provide a high level overview of some of the potential water quality impacts of the Cameron Peak fire on the City of Fort Collins source water supplies. Um, so I'm going to start out by providing some background on the city's source water supplies, and then I'm going to move into describing the rich history of recent wildfires impacting these important resources. Then move on to how wildfires can impact both our source water quality as well as create um, water treatment challenges for the city, and then finish up with ways the city of Fort Collins mitigates these potential water quality impacts. So a source watershed is a watershed that supplies raw or untreated water for water treatment. And the city receives its drinking water from two primary source watersheds. The first is the Poudre River source watershed and that's pretty much um, everything in the Poudre River watershed upstream of the city's drinking water intake located at Gateway Park and is, is depicted in tan in this map. Um, our Horsetooth Reservoir source watershed is shown in uh, grayish blue just to the west of Fort Collins in this map. And the Horsetooth watershed includes a small drainage to the west of Horsetooth, but mostly what the reservoir consists of water from the Colorado Big Thompson system or the CBT system. And it's actually a terminal reservoir on the CBT system. So exceptionally hot and dry conditions in both 2012 and 2020 led to extreme wildfire conditions throughout Colorado and led to three major wildfires in the upper Poudre. The Hewlett Gulch fire shown in light orange in the middle of this map um, ignited in mid-May of 2012 and burned about 8,000 acres of low elevation forest near our drinking water intake. About two weeks after the Hewlett Gulch fire was considered contained, the High Park fire ignited and burned an additional approximately 87,000 um, acres of low and mid-elevation forest in both the in both our Poudre River source watershed and then a small portion of the Horsetooth Reservoir source watershed as well. Um, the 2012 fires burned soils and vegetation and they had an immediate impact on the hydrology as well as water quality within and downstream of the burn scars. And um, we saw increases in stream flow and overland flow from the burned areas, especially during and following um, high intensity 
thunderstorm thunderstorm events. And I don't know if you if you can see this because the 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 images of the photos or the um, videos are on the right side of the slide. But um, both of these fires occurred. Um, the dates for these fires occurred just before the monsoon season in 2012, which was which is when we typically see our highest intensity rainstorm events every year in this part of the country. Um, so we also saw significant sediment erosion uh, from hill from burns hill slopes following these fires, and this released um, carbon nutrients and other elements into the into the pooter and had a big effect on water quality. Uh, this slide is a long trend long term trend summary of several key water quality parameters uh, between the years 2008 and 2018. Um, from a study location uh, right near our drinking water intake on the main stem pooter. And what I really wanna point your attention to is the abrupt change in, in concentration for all of these key parameters. Um, I'm happy to report that as of 2020, all of these parameters and pretty much every water quality parameter that was impacted by the 2012 fires had returned to what we would expect or baseline conditions. But the bad news, of course, is that we're expecting, uh, with the Cameron Peak fire, which I'll get, get to in a second here, we're expecting water quality to again degrade in the Poudre as of uh, spring, spring snowmelt runoff in 2021. So, and finally, um, the Cameron Peak fire, shown in red and pink in, the, in this map, started near Chambers Lake in the upper Poudre watershed on August 13th of 2020 and burned approximately 209,000 acres of the Upper Pooter. Um, this is the largest fire in Colorado state history, and it affected a range of forest types, including high elevation spruce fir communities up near Cameron Pass, um, all the way down to Ponderosa Pine communities in the, in the lower foothills in both the uh, Big Thompson watershed and the Pooter River watershed. Uh, so, so far we haven't seen any water quality impacts from the Cameron Peak fire on our Poudre River source water quality, um, but we're fully expecting this to change in 2021. So this slide um, summarizes some of the, some of the anticipated or potential um, impacts to our source water quality, as well as um, associated water treatment challenges um, that we're expecting to see from the Cameron Peak fire uh, next year. Um, one of the biggest concerns that we have um, is related to um, several, several of the high mountain reservoirs in the Upper Pooter. Um, several of those reservoirs either moderately or severely burned in the Cameron Peak fire, including their contributing watersheds. And we're, con we're concerned that subsequent sediment erosion and ash um, erosion and loading, as well as nutrients to these reservoirs, um, is going to increase our risk for blue-green algae blooms and cyanobacteria or cyanobacteria blooms. It's a synonymous term um, in the future. And Certain species of blue-green algae can produce not only taste and odor compounds, which are a um, challenge for our drinking water treatment process, but they can also produce cyanotoxins as well. Um, another confounding factor is that um, during late summer and into winter, the stream flows in most of the pooter, in most of the upper pooter, are dominated by reservoir releases. So if we do see this, uh, these impacts, these algal bloom impacts, um, we're expecting to see poor water quality downstream as well um, during that period. And then lastly, um, for um, increases in nutrients, we, or for, res excuse me, for the reservoir impacts, uh, we've collected, we collected water quality samples in 2020 and we're currently working with um, Matt Ross up at CSU and um, a handful of other watershed stakeholders to develop a, a post-fire reservoir study. Um, so the utility is also concerned with um, increases in turbidity that we're expecting to see post-fire. Um, turbidity at high concentrations is, is a huge challenge to treat, um, but there's also um, the added issue of, of, there's also associated pollutants that come along for the ride with elevated turbidity. If you get elevated turbidity, a lot of times you're going to get elevated metals, nutrients, um, pathogens, and so forth. Um, we're concerned with increases, the expected increases in total organic carbon concentrations as well as alkalinity because um, it, the increases in these two constituents can increase the risk of disinfection byproducts being formed during treatment. Um, we're concerned with increases in sediment load into the watershed because sediment can just, 
it, it can damage infrastructure directly by clogging pipes and damaging head, head gates and other infrastructure, but it can also have uh, sediment bound pollutants similar to turbidity, um, which can be an issue for treatment as well. And then lastly, we're concerned with the potential for increases in hardness because of the, the risk of mineral deposits or scale. So this, this figure is a general schematic of the city's drinking water process. And, uh, and it starts with our two source water supplies in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Post-storm runoff following the 2012 wildfires uh, was so severe that the water quality was so bad from post-fire post runoff that the city actually shut down our Poudre River intake for a period of three months and went completely over to our horse tooth source water supply. And the ability for the city to alternate between our two source water supplies is still going to be our most effective um, mitigation tool for combating or dealing with uh, water quality impacted or wildfire impacted water quality uh, after the Cameron Peak fire. And the biggest threat to the utility would be if both of our source water sheds were impacted at the same time. Um, so following the 2012 wildfires, the city invested in pre-sedimentation basins as part of our process. And so what this this what these basins essentially are, are, are basins that allow fast moving water off the pooter to come in and slow down for a little bit to let suspended particles uh, settle out of solution before the water moves on and into um, the treatment plant. So it's a really nice passive way for us to clean up water before it enters the plant. Uh, so just to finish out this schematic, after water leaves the pre-sedimentation basins, it um, goes through a rapid mix where coagulant is added, which binds to any, uh, any particulates that are in the water, forms flocculant. The flocculant settles out and solids are removed. At this point, the water is, is uh, really clean, very clean, but it goes through um, an additional sand filtering process to remove any additional impurities that might be left over. After that, the water goes uh, into the clear well where a handful of chemicals are added and then it's considered finished at that point and is moved over to storage reservoirs um, before entering our distribution system and going out to our residential and commercial customers. So the city will be monitoring water quality in real time in 2020 using two meters installed on the Poudre River, approximately two miles and 20 miles above our drinking water intake at Gateway Park. Um, the photos on the right of this slide show a picture in the upper left of what one of these meters looks like. Um, right below that, there's a photo of what the sensors look like that actually do the, the measuring of water quality. And then the right-hand photo, hopefully you can, I don't think you can see that, but it's of an install. And it's, it's, it's pretty low profile side install. Um, and there's a PVC um, pipe that runs down into the stream. And what we do is we slide the meter down into the pipe, protects it from damage from debris flows in the river, but still allows the meter to, to measure water quality. Um, so these meters measure temperature pH, they measure conductivity, which is a measure of electrical conductance. They measure dissolved oxygen, and then they also measure turbidity, which I, I forgot to mention earlier, that's essentially a measure of water clarity. Um, they measure at 15 minute intervals, which we consider real time. And then we use telemetry to push the data from these two sites to two different platforms. One is a web platform that the city uses for um, a variety of stormwater sites and other um, sites that the city already has in place, but um, it's called a contra contrail web platform. And the uh, the plots on the left-hand side of the slide show, it's, it's a, a, a screenshot of what the data look like when they come into Contrail and are plotted up. And this is from uh, September of 2020, so when the fire was still raging up in the canyon. Um, the other platform that the data are, are pushed out to is our SCADA control system here at the plant. And the SCADA control system is basically what the operators use to control the plant. Um, we have established thresholds, so seasonal water quality thresholds for turbidity, conductivity, and pH, um, that allow, and we have alerts tied to those. And so if we, um, if we have, um, for example, conductivity is out of range for what we would expect, um, I'll get a text message, an alert, letting me know that that's happening so that you know, I and other utility staff can follow up and, and investigate what's going on. So spikes in river turbidity um, can be used by our treatment staff to indicate when post-fire erosion is happening. 
and um, from ash and sediment coming off of, of erosive hill slopes. And um, a city staff are going to continue to use this system to provide an early warning of, of these pollution events or these pollution plumes coming down the pooter and give us adequate time to be able to shut down our intake if necessary, rather than pull that stuff into the plant. And lastly, we're going to be using this system to let us know when these pollution events are happening so we can get up the mountain and collect storm samples um, so that we know what the chemistry of this water is. Um, so we keep an eye on that and study that, um, but also to inform a variety of different research projects, uh, one of which is to look at the occurrence, uh, one that we have in the hopper right now is to look at the occurrence of smoke related compounds, a suite of compounds in our source water supplies. And if we find them um, to also follow up and find out if um, those compounds are also um, also occur in our um, finished water, if they make it through our treatment process. So the city also monitors our pooter and horse tooth source watersheds using a two long-term cost share water quality monitoring programs. And the objectives of both the programs are to provide information to water treatment staff as well as our customers to assess short and long-term water quality trends, to understand natural and human induced natural and human induced disturbances and how they impact water quality. And then lastly, to maintain and improve the overall health of these two important watersheds. Um, so the Upper Pooter program is led by City of Fort Collins Watershed Program and includes partner utilities Greeley and Soldier Canyon Water Authority. And the horse tooth program is led by Northern Water and it's just a partnership between Fort Collins and Northern Water. Um, both programs target a variety of sites. The sites for the um, Upper Pooter program and our Pooter, wa Pooter source watershed are shown as orange dots in the map. Um, we also have three study locations on the on horse tooth reservoir, but they weren't practical to plot on this on that small uh, reservoir there. So, but they're located at Spring Canyon, Dixon Canyon, and then at Soldier Canyon where our intake is located. Um, we collect samples in spring through fall with both programs every year. And um, parameters include a variety of relevant physical, chemical, and biological parameters. And then lastly, for, for both, of these pro both of these programs produce um, long-term trend reports. And actually for the Pooter, for the Pooter program, we, we produce annual trend reports, which are short-term trend reports. And then we also produce five-year trend reports as well. Um, and then we produce seasonal updates as well for the Pooter program in spring, summer, and fall, which are these snapshots of water quality that are um, designed to be user-friendly for anybody. And then the horse tooth program, uh, for the horse tooth program, Northern Water produces trend reports um, every two to three years. And then we work up, the watershed program staff work up the data on a more regular basis for water treatment staff. And so lastly, um, I wanted to touch on the watershed program source water protection plan, which we developed in 2016. This plan is essentially a structured guide that we use to direct our source water protection efforts. And it includes a, an inventory and a map of potential source water pollution threats. It ranks them from high to low based on their relative risk to source water quality. And then it provides a range of best practices that we can um, used to mitigate the potential risk of, of the different pollutants. Um, not surprisingly, the highest, the highest priority pollution threat was identified as pollution associated with high intensity large scale wildfires. And some of the associated BMPs or best practices included uh, working collaboratively with other stakeholders to prioritize wildfire mitigation and restoration projects. And some of the photos on the right of this slide show what uh, these projects look like, but you may not be able to see the one on the far right. Uh, the one on the upper left is of some volunteers spreading mulch to stabilize an erosive hill slope post fire. Um, the one below that is of Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed staff and volunteers installing um, channel stabilization structures and a small drainage that blew out after the High Park fire and sent debris flows down to the Poudre above our intake. And then the photo on the right is you. It, it is of a it is a of a wildfire of of a a firefighter, but you can't see the firefighter. And um, he is not fighting a fire, but he is actually working a prescribed burn that is part of a wildfire mitigation project that the city funded with other regional partners in the Elkhorn Creek drainage, which is a major tributary to the Poudre above our intake as well. And so lastly, um, supporting the coalition for the Poudre River watershed its organiz organizational capacity as well as their projects is a critical best practice for the city 
CPRW is a super important partner for us in um, brokering um, priority mitigation and restoration, wildfire mitigation and restoration projects on private lands. And their staff are also um, prominent leaders in the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative. And for those of you who don't know, that collaborative's main goal is to align uh, mitigation projects across private and, pub private and public jurisdictions to get a, a larger landscape level effect. And the Cameron Peak Fire Incident Command specifically mentioned the importance of those mitigation projects to helping slow the, the spread and the scale of the Cameron Peak Fire. Um, CPRW has also been really um, key for us in leading our local recovery group and um, various technical groups and then just generally leading communications and the planning and implementation process forward. And so the most important um, lesson that the city may have learned out of the 2012 fires is the importance of supporting a strong local watershed coalition. And so with that, um, thanks again for inviting me today and I'll open it up to any questions you might have at the end of this, that is. Yeah, I thank you so much. Um, Mike, do you want to take the floor? I might as well. Might as well. Um, okay, just give me one second here while I pull up my screen. Okay, there we go. Perfect. So um, I was asked to talk about uh, the wildland urban interface as an ecosystem service. Um, I normally don't think about uh, the WUI as an ecosystem service, but uh, when Nate called me and asked me to speak, um, we had a quick chat and I thought, well, that's a really interesting uh, you know, take on uh, the WUI. Um, you know, most of the time, um, ecosystem services, you know, these are the things that ecosystems provide to um, humanity, right? It's uh, the clean air, uh, the drinking water, um, you know, that Richard just uh, spoke about, um, the ability of the forest, the ability of these ecosystems in order to provide the things uh, that we need um, as a society, whether, um, you know, that's wood for our homes or places to like recreate or to hunt. Um, that's kind of normally what we think about uh, when we think of ecosystem services, but um, you know, these wildlands also provide us with a habitable place to uh, live. You know, um, I live um, in town, but, uh, you know, lots of people uh, live up in the hills and, um, you know, there's something really nice about that. Uh, at, at times, I wish my house was surrounded by uh, trees instead of other homes. So thinking about uh, the WUI as a habitable place to live, right, as, as an ecosystem service, um, and then how, how does fire affect that? Um, you know, Richard just gave a great talk about how, um, how fire and the recent fires in particular are affecting uh, the water supply. So kind of overlaying those, you know, those natural phenomena with uh, the engineered system of a water utility, um, you know, really helps us kind of understand those um, interactions. So, uh, the wildland urban interface also provides us with a habitable place to uh, live. Um, as you can see here on the uh, map, um, you know, kind of zoomed out view of a similar thing uh, that Richard, as a similar image or map that Richard provided, um, these, are, these are two of the large wildfires that we had this past summer, Cameron Peak and um, East Trouble. Some, you know, I think you also see uh, the Calwood fire. Williams Fork fire, and then uh, the Mullen fire up on top. Um, the Cameron Peak fire burned over 200 homes. Uh, East Troublesome fire burned over 200 homes in and around Grand Lake. Um, so if, if the WUI, if the ecosystem service, if it's supposed to provide a habitable place to uh, live, and we keep on having these big bad wildfires and they keep on burning homes, it really makes us question um, the ability or the, the thought that uh, the WUI is providing those ecosystem services. Are those at, like, are those at uh, risk? You know, maybe if we keep on seeing these big bad fires, you know, maybe it's not able to provide a habitable place to live. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about 
Uh, just a quick overview of what the Wyland Urban Interface is. I imagine some of you have heard of the term, others maybe not. So we'll do a quick overview on that. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of my research, um, kind of focusing on uh, these patterns of home loss in the Wyland Urban Interface, in some of these big bad fires, and um, you know, kind of what that means going forwards in terms of uh, the ability of the WUI to provide a habitable place for us to live. So uh, just real quick, um, in essence, uh, the wildland urban interface is that uh, transition zone, right? It's where homes and other buildings and infrastructure are located either uh, within or adjacent to um, uh, wildlands, you know, often uh, wildfire prone um, uh, wildlands. Um, you know, there's a number of, here, here, here the image on the right, kind of, you know, we think of this um, as, a, as a transition from those forested ecosystems all the way to a place uh, like downtown Fort Collins and then everything in between. So as you move from the wildlands to the more urban areas, um, you know, vegetation changes, um, uh, the pattern of homes, the type of construction material slowly changes. Uh, we have more roads, more in, impermeable um, and fire resistant surfaces with the roads and sidewalks. And so as we go through this, you know, I want you to keep this in mind, right? So kind of that transition from the pure wildlands um, over to the intermix, those homes that are intermixed with the wildlands, the interface, those homes that are adjacent to uh, wildland vegetation, and then uh, the ember zone, right? So we'll talk about that in a little bit, but as, as a wildfire moved through an environment, um, the trees catch fire, often those em often uh, bits of those trees are launched up into a smoke column and then they in essence throw embers um, you know, several hundred meters or you know, maybe even a couple miles ahead of those fires. Um, when that happens in the wildlands, they can start uh, new spot fires, which, which uh, contribute to fire growth. When that happens in and around um, communities and residential areas, um, we can set um, homes on fire. Um, that's kind of my research is focused on those patterns of home loss. And so um, I did just want to say, right, in terms of those eco, in terms of uh, the WUI as an ecosystem service, I'm focused on home loss, but there's a number of um, ecosystem services that uh, the wildlands provide, right? You know, so in terms of those problems, we have the homes, kind of they disrupt, they, they disrupt ecological processes and um, habitat. Um, um, like Richard mentioned, this impacts our like, watersheds. Um, those of you in Fort Collins this past summer certainly realized it, inter it, inter it, uh, it affected our um, air shed as well. There were a few days there where I don't, I don't even want to step outside of the house because uh, it got hard to breathe real quick. So, you know, these are the different types of things that uh, we have to worry about. Um, when we live in the Wooly. So um, here's just uh, some more background information. Uh, the, the figure on the on the left here came out of some research done in Australia. Uh, the figure on the right, I think I forgot to add the citation there or the credit, but I think that comes from uh, Colorado State Forest Service, some of their defensible space uh, recommendations. So um, the image on the left here is like a temporal uh, component so as a fire encroaches on a, on a community, um, embers can be uh, you know, lofted up from, from wildland vegetation that's burning and they can actually ignite homes uh, before the fire itself even gets there. Um, in that middle image, fire passing the home, that, that flaming front um, also very dangerous for homes, uh, but uh, the majority of the homes are, are burned through the um, embers in that top image. And then um, post fire, there's actually a risk there as well. So after the fire moves through a community, uh, oftentimes uh, there aren't enough firefighters to uh, you know protect those homes because they have to, in some cases, back out to a safe, uh, a safe, a safe area. And so those those embers can ignite kind of creeping ground fires, kind of small smoldering fires creep around through the vegetation adjacent to homes. And if no one's there to 
put the fire out, um, you can see home loss. And often this occurs 24, sometimes 48 hours um, after the fire actually passes. Um, and then, like I said, over on the right, this is prob probably a review for a lot of you, but you know the way we uh, really try and mitigate home loss and prevent it is by enacting uh, defensible space, right? This is, this is by modifying and removing the vegetation immediately surrounding a home, 100 feet, 200 feet, something like that. And then also adjusting um, home construction, building out of fire resistant materials, that home hardening and throw. So through modifying the vegetation and uh, modifying the home construction materials, we can, we can make our homes more fire um, resistant. Um, here's, here's just some other stuff uh, on uh, the wildland urban interface. Here on the top left, you see that diagram um, this is this is this is uh, this is borrowed from a paper on risk management in uh, wildland fire, and it 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 conceives as as the risk of home loss as kind of that primary problem. This is um, the wooey problem, as it's uh, commonly known. Um, there on the bottom, there by the actions, you can see preventing ignitions, uh, you know, uh, managing and reducing fuel. Uh, you know, land use planning and then kind of um, you know, modifying the home ignition zone, all things that folks can do to help protect homes, often homeowners, um, local fire departments. Um, you know, those are the folks who are kind of act, act actively, um, you know, reducing the risk in our uh, wooey communities. Um, um, the image on the bottom there and the image on the right are different types of of uh, maps of the wildland urban interface. Often we map the wildland urban interface using census data. Um, we can also use uh, remote sensing products and uh, satellite imagery in order to in order to detect uh, like uh, where people live. Sometimes they even take satellite imagery at uh, night and the, or they quantify the pattern of uh, light. So all the lights that we leave on in our homes when we go to bed, um, they can kind of aggregate that up and they get a good idea of where people are, are, are living. And then uh, the image on the bottom there, they can actually, um, you know, nowadays uh, we really have a fine resolution uh, structured data. Uh, Microsoft uh, just came out with a data set a few years ago where uh, we can map individual individual structures and homes across uh, the whole country. Um, I think there's one 125 million buildings uh, in that data set. It's not totally comprehensive, but um, it really gives you a good idea kind of where those homes are. And then once we know where those homes are, um, we can we can start to figure out which homes are at uh, risk, right? Uh, which homes are in the wildland urban interface, which homes are surrounded by wildland vegetation, um, you know, which homes are in the urban areas, but they're still close enough to the wildland vegetation where uh, they might ignite in a uh, wildfire um, anyway. So that's what, uh, that's, uh, what my research is all about, or that's what some of my research is all about. Uh, just had a paper published um, a couple months ago on building loss in in uh, wooey disasters and kind of evaluating the different components of um, the wooey definition. Um, I guess I skipped over that earlier, but you know the way we define the wooey is the presence of vegetation, the presence of homes, and then um, the proximity. So how close are the homes to the vegetation? Because without that, um, without having them both. You're not going to lose homes in a wildfire. So um, what we did is we mapped uh, all the biggest, baddest wildfires um, over the last 20 or so years using um, some government uh, reports, the ICS 209, if some of you are familiar. Um, that map on the top, um, you see all the points there. Um, symbolized by the magnitude of the fire. So how many homes were lost in each of these big bad fires? Um, there's about a hundred fires in our country's history that have burned more than 50 homes. That's the threshold uh, that we used. Um, 
you will note, you know, they are kind of concentrated there on the front range of Colorado, um, some in uh, Texas. And then there's those two big hot spots, uh, one in Northern, uh, Northern California, one in uh, Southern uh, California. Um, uh, this analysis uh, did the years 2000 through 2018. So this is not including um, East Troublesome and, um, and uh, the Cameron Peak fire. But um, if we do an update, um, those would be included. Like I said earlier, I think they both burned a little over 200 homes. Um, and so what we did is uh, we looked at all those of, of of events, how many of those events happen each uh, year, and then how many homes are burning each year, on on um, you know this these sorts of phenomena are highly cyclical. Um, you know, um, like Richard said, uh, here in Colorado, uh, we had a bad year in 2012 with High Park, and then we had a bad year again this past year. So it's not a straight line. There's a lot of ups and downs, but on a whole, we are seeing more of these events across the country. Uh, we are burning more and more homes every year, um, averaging about 2,500 homes uh, lost on a yearly basis. Um, you know, that goes up and down. I think there were about 15,000 or so, which were lost in uh, the campfire a few years ago. So that kind of pulls the average up. But um, we might very well start to see kind of more of those uh, types of fires, unfortunately. Um, the image on the right here is just an overview of uh, the data uh, that we used in this analysis. Um, so we identified those, I think we used about 70, 70 fires, either the 70 most destructive fires in our country's history. Uh, we mapped uh, where the fire was and where all the homes were, um, including both um, unburned homes and burned homes. And then we did an analysis to see how well um, the WUI maps kind of capture these patterns of home loss and uh, where that home loss is uh, occurring. Um, you know, like I said earlier, there are those intermix areas where the homes are intermixed with the wildlands. And then there are those interface areas where those homes are adjacent to the wildlands. And so here's just a quick um, you know, kind of snapshot. Um, you see all those fires there, as well as um, the percentage of home loss in each of those like uh, categories. So, so we see about 70% of the homes that were lost were in uh, the wild and urban inner, inner, inner mix. Um, those are the areas that where homes are completely surrounded by wildland vegetation. Um, we see somewhere like 20, 30 percent of those homes are lost in the interface. Those homes are not surrounded by wildland vegetation, but they're ad adjacent to wildland vegetation. So those homes are likely burning um, from those embers that are caught on those trees that are caught on fire in the wildlands. They launch an ember up that travels a certain distance, it lands close to a house house on fire and that's that that's the home loss mechanism um the other possibility there hold on um it's gonna get loud for a second but my kids just came home from school um excuse me yes yeah, so um the other home loss mechanism is um home to home ignition um those of you here on the front range might be familiar with this on uh, the Waldo Canyon fire uh, back in 2012, was it, where those where that fire came out of the wildlands into a residential community and started burning homes. So one home lights on fire, that sets the next home on fire, and it's a domino effect. So you know we're trying to quantify what that process um, is going to look like. Um, excuse me, I have a uh, rambunctious uh, seven and four year old. We just got uh, dropped off and I don't think they respect the fact that I'm giving a presentation to over hundred people right now. <laughs> but uh, that's just the way it goes when you're working from home. Cool, so um, this is this right here is, is the figure that I'm super excited about. Um, again, I, I, I put these two figures up on the right here that we've seen several times now. Um, you know, you kind of see those the home ignites from the embers that are lost further away. So what we're seeing here is a graph 
that maps um, where homes are lost relative to um, the distance they are from uh, wildland vegetation. Um, okay, I, I think they got the message to be quiet. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, the main takeaway here is that um, we're seeing homes lost up to 850 meters away from the edge of uh, wildland vegetation. So that means those embers are traveling really far and still setting those homes on fire. Um, however, 90% uh, of the 90% of homes or 95% of homes are lost within 100 meters of wildland vegetation. So a lot of those embers aren't traveling um, all that far. So those homes that are further away from the wildland vegetation are at like a lower risk than those homes that are um, surrounded by wildland vegetation. Um, you know, that, that result, that finding does seem kind of um, 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 intuitive. Um, it makes sense that if you're surrounded by the woods, you're more likely to burn. If you're not surrounded by vegetation, you're less likely to burn, but it's important to like quantify that. Um, um, you know, like I, I explained earlier, uh, we define the WUI based on the presence of homes, the presence of vegetation, and um, the proximity, how close they are to one another. So a lot of these historical WUI mapping efforts have used um, a buffer distance of 2,400 meters. Um, it's a mile and a half. Um, that's uh, the distance it was assumed an ember could travel. Um, and while we do have some you know, anecdotal observations that that can happen, we don't see home loss happening at that mile and a half away from the wildland vegetation. So we can kind of, uh, you know, we can, tweak, uh, we can tweak the buffer distance that we use and kind of calibrate that buffer distance according to home loss. Um, you know, here, here, uh, here's two maps, one in Northern Colorado, one in Southern, Southern California, and you see uh, the difference in the interface um, and the intermix. Again, those homes that are adjacent to wildland vegetation and those homes that are intermixed with wildland vegetation. So what our research is showing is the vast majority of homes that are lost are surrounded by wildland vegetation. And these fires are not coming into urban, urban areas and kind of dense residential communities uh, that often. It is happening in some, in some instances uh, the Tubbs fire in California was one notable uh, fire. Uh, like I said, uh, Waldo Canyon was another notable example. Um, so we can kind of use this information to tweak uh, the WUI maps. And that, you know, what that can do at a broad scale is help us, uh, uh, you know, better estimate uh, the number of homes that are actually uh, um, um, at, at uh, risk. Um, you know, here's, here's just a few kind of snapshots of some recent research um, that kind of show, hey, the WUI is growing. Um, you know, this is an important issue. You know, we can start to assess kind of that transmission of fire risk between public and private lands. It's not always going from public to private. Often it actually goes from private to public. Um, you know, like Richard mentioned, uh, the, the city is supporting a lot of those fuels reduction treatments those prescribed fires of mechanical work around their infrastructure in the watershed, around the urban interface communities as well. So it's important for us to get a good handle on where these homes are at risk um, in order to help plan where these treatments should occur. Um, and so those are kind of the um, implications. And that's about all I have. I think we have time for some questions still. Um, and I'll stop sharing and let Gloria answer those questions. And um, but once again, um, I do apologize for my uh, rambunctious uh, children. I hope uh, hope that wasn't too disruptive. Oh, there were very uh, comments put in chat. By, no problem. <laughs> Hi, kids. <laughs> I think they're outside playing now. Awesome. awesome. Oh, oh. <laughs> Everybody's joining in the presentation. It's a community thing. Um, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Mike, very much for your time this afternoon. And of course, as usual, we have a lot of questions and a good discussion. I'm going to try to um, um, 
group some of these concepts. Um, Ty, if you could launch the poll before people start, start hopping off. Great, thank you very much. And please fill out this poll. We are soft funded, soft money funded, and this helps, uh, this is essential to improving our programs. Um, so I'll start, uh, go ahead with uh, Richard. And I, we had a really interesting question. Richard, in some instances, there's been a biochar used to clean algae and absorb um, excess nutrients and stuff. Is that a possibility? Although it seems kind of counterintuitive because most of the stuff coming down will be ash, but bio, could biochar be used as an absorptive technique? Yeah, it, it could be. I mean, at the stage we're, the stage we're at right now is to, is to just get a handle on kind of what, what to expect, you know, what the impacts will be, um, what the, what the in-stream impacts will be down, downstream as well. And then, yeah, you know, there, there's a variety of different mitigation options going forward, but to be honest, we really haven't had our heads, our sights on that at all right now. It's mostly just like, okay, what are we looking at? We were already concerned about reservoir releases and nutrients before the fire, and now we're really concerned about it. We think that this is just going to elevate the risk. So, so yes, that's a potential mitigation option, but we're just not even thinking about that right now. So first things does, first. Yeah. Does the city of Fort Collins have access to funds and infrastructure and supplies to create we something like that? We do. The, the reservoirs that were impacted, so we we're fortunate. There's silver linings to, hopefully there's silver linings to bad situations like these fires. And one for us was that our reservoirs didn't burn in it. We had the Joe Wright Reservoir watershed was just barely touched. The ones that were impacted belonged to water supply and storage in Greeley and city of Greeley. And um, so we do have we do have infrastructure dollars, but we wouldn't be putting those dollars into that infrastructure since it's not ours. But what we would want to do is we're like we're we're leading the charge on pulling together stakeholders to study these reservoirs and the impacts on the watershed and what you know how we deal with it. Because that's 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 kind of where we're at. You know, we we provide water and we want to know <laughs> what what those impacts will be. So great. Um, let me see if there's uh for other listeners, we've posted Richard's um, email. Um, sorry, Richard, you're gonna be inundated and with, with emails now. Uh, rthorpe at fcgov.com. Uh, Richard, we have one more question for you. What does the process at the water treatment plant look like when your upstream sensors detect water quality measurements? Does Fort Collins, Fort, Fort Collins switching to horse tooth have implications for downstream users? Okay, so the first, so the first part of that, I'll take the first part of it. When we, so we have a turbidity threshold of 100 NTUs, and so when we reach that threshold, we just shut down the intake. Before that, we have thresholds and we have alarms set to let our our operators, our treatment staff, know when these slugs of bad water are coming, and then they can make decisions on on what they want to do. Sometimes you can blend. I mean, oftentimes we blend the two water supplies. So you can take the you know the edge off of the poor water quality coming from the pooter, and a lot of the a lot of times those I mean to a point if the water's bad enough they just shut down. You don't want to pull that stuff into the plant, but a lot of it's based on the different um, shares of water we have in the pooter versus horse tooth, and there's a lot of water accounting decisions that go on. Ultimately, we're we're trying to provide um, high quality water to our customers, and so that's going to be that's ultimately what's going to drive the decision. Um, so yes, we use the 100 NTU to shut down the intake if necessary, the other parameters, other alerts just guide decisions. And then the second part of that question, could you repeat that? Does Fort Collins switching to horse tooth have implications for downstream users? Um, well, no, those, those, we, we own shares in the, in the Colorado Big Thompson system. And so that's, that's water that's already, you know, that, that we've already purchased that's ours. There is most of the water in Horse Tooth Reservoir is um, um, owned by agricultural interests. And so there's only a, a relatively small proportion that is uh, for water utilities. So, but no, it's it's not, I mean, the, both of those, but our, our water supplies in both of those source watersheds, that's, that's what they're there for. They're for us to use them 
to provide water for our customers. So I hope that answers the question, but it's, yeah, it's not taking water from, in Colorado, uh, every every bit of the water is is allocated and um, yeah, we're, it, that's that that would be our water when we take it out of horse tooth. Okay, that's great. We have one more question for Richard. We have about um, eight more minutes. Um, the webinar technically ends at four o'clock and students can leave and, and discuss elsewhere. Uh, we have a few minutes to play with for discussion if we need to after four. Um, so we have one more question for Richard and then I think I can group two themes of questions in there for Mike. Uh, Richard, what's the recovery timeline for water quality treatment given an average precipitation scenario who, you know, going forward, who knows what's going to be average, but uh, what are we looking at for, you know, if we had average precipitation, what's the recovery timeline look like for this? And do you have an estimate of water? Well, I'll ask, I'll ask the second part later. Okay, so the first part of that, what I'm, what I think I'm hearing, if it's a treatment related question, that's a little out of my expertise, but what I think I'm hearing is what, what, you know, if we have an average precipitation year, and you know, and maybe even going forward, if we have average precipitation years, what's the recovery time for the watershed and our source water quality? Um, I'm going to go with that as my interpretation of the first part of that question. And we're expecting 2021 is going to be um, bad. We're expecting there's going to be a lot of there's going to be black water events. The ash is going to come off first. Um, it's going to, um, then we're going to get more sediment, sediment coming off the hill slopes. It's going to take years. I mean, we just, we just saw water quality return to baseline from the 2012 fires um, in 2020. And, um, and then the other thing about this one is it's a do totally different animal than what we saw before. Um, and there's some good and some bad to that. The, the um, we, 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 Mike can speak to this. Um, it, the, we don't, we haven't seen wildfires this high up, you know, that much in Colorado. Like this is this is something that's very different. The communities that were burned, and then the and the reservoir effects. It's just going to be. We're just going to have to sort through it as we go. Um, and then the watershed that supplies horse tooth was also severely burned in the East Troublesome fire. So we're kind of somewhat between a rock and a hard place. So. Um, and then the second part of that, can you re repeat the second part of that? It was more of a quantity related question. Do you have an estimate of water quantity impacts um, of fire given, given average precipitation? So is if we expect precipitation to be the same average, uh, what, what can we expect in terms of water quantity? Yeah, so given the same um, the same type of, of of precipitation year, so say as an average year, you don't have the Cameron Peak fire, and then you do have the Cameron Peak fire. The same area that was burned is going to shed a lot of water, and that's that creates um, flooding risk downstream. We're very concerned about that. Um, yeah, but yeah, just generally, when that water falls, we're expecting it to come off a lot faster, and uh, because there's just not going to there's not as much vegetation to take it up the soils. In a lot of cases, you know, have been uh, rendered hydrophobic. Um, so, great, thanks. Um, we will be saving this chat record, and if we don't get to some of your questions, we'll be saving this with the speakers, and perhaps they can get back to you later. Um, Mike, we have kind of two different themes in the questions for you, and some are more technical questions about um wooey treatments and what recent research has been shown to to um, highlight the best management practices in wooey for ecolog maintaining ecological integrity around structures as well as making sure that your work your return on investment in a fire event is working uh, so let's let's address that one first you know is there recent research that's showing you know, hey, is there a magic bullet? Is there something in met new methods that's really working? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm happy to talk about that. You know, um, what? Uh, not my research, but other 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 folks working in this arena are showing those um, home hardening techniques are, are um, you know very effective, right? It's that area immediately surrounding the home. 
you know, there's there's also uh, the, the other uh, other facet that we need to consider is uh, the fire behavior itself. Often these treatments are effective up to a certain threshold. And after that threshold, um, all bets are off. Um, we often design our treatments to, to be effective if firefighters are present. If fire behavior is so extreme that fire behaviors that fire fighters are not able to be present, you know, they're they're not able to kind of protect those homes themselves. Um, so, um, you know, kind of working the home and, and, and that home home hardening, home construction material is probably the most effective thing uh, that we can do. Unfortunately, that's all, often uh, the new roof. Um, those kind of uh, you know those big ticket items. Um, you know, cutting down a few trees in the backyard might be uh, you know fairly low cost, but in terms of effectiveness, um, it's that new roof that's going to matter. Um, you know, we do see things in uh, camera. You know, one of the things we saw in Camera Peak was that those large prescribed fires had actually had an effect on fire spread in a way those smaller treatments um, just weren't able to. You know, the, the scale of our management needs to be commensurate with the scale of um, the disturbance. You know, the other other kind of complicating fact, you know, that said, we often don't see large prescribed fires around homes themselves. Um, um, you know, the other complicating factor is, um, you know, like I said earlier, these treatments are effective up to a, up to a certain threshold. However, um, we're really good at suppressing fire and we suppress 97, 98% of all fire. What we we're really good at suppressing those fires when the conditions are uh, moderate, when fire behavior is is low or moderate. Once that fire behavior is extreme, uh, we're no longer effective at suppressing those. And so that's kind of what we see in in um, these big bad fires in the in Hyde Park, in Cameron Peak. Um, what our research showed was that 80% um, of all home loss in our nation's history from wildfire. Um, occurred in about a hundred fires, right? So the top less than the less than top less than one percent most destructive fires are responsible for eighty percent of all home loss. So these the these home loss events are concentrated. Wildfires aren't the problem. You see these extreme wildfires that are that um, are the problem. I don't know if that answered the question, but I hope so. I, I think that really encompasses a lot of people's questions. Uh, we have, oh, I don't know, we have a minute, so if it's okay yeah. with uh, platform people, we'll just stay on a little bit. Ty, is that all right? Okay, great. Thumbs up. Um, so, uh, so off of that, do we have different, the, the fun question is different, fun wording, do we have different flavors of mitigation between the interface and the intermix areas? Well, uh. Well, yes, we do. You know, I, I think, um, you know, when you're in those interface areas, those, those kind of more residential areas adjacent to the wildlands, you don't have a lot of wildland vegetation. So you're not going to see those big forestry treatments. And that's where, you know, focusing on uh, the home makes sense. Interestingly, um, they found uh, white picket fences were acted like fuses in uh, the Waldo Canyon fire. Uh, they connected one house to the next. One house goes up and lights the fence on fire that travels to the next house, lights that one on fire, fence to the next, you know, so it's, it's things like that. So, you know, when we're in those interface areas, we're modifying the built environment. Um, immediately adjacent to those interface areas, you know, that's where we would get a lot of some benefits from a large fuel treatment. You know, you, you, you could think through a fuel break on the edge of an edge of community, a large prescribed fire adjacent to a community as kind of protecting that community and reducing the risk. If you have those interspersed homes out in the woods, right, a single home, a single cabin in the middle of the woods, you know, that homeowner might very well do everything in his or her ability to protect the home, harden the home, treat the area around the home, that defensible space, but in order you know, an organization like uh, the U.S. Forest Service, maybe, are they going to invest in a large fuel treatment adjacent to one home? Probably not, unless there's other benefits there. Um, so, yeah, we do need to tailor our mitigation efforts according to um, interface or intermix or the different types of uh, wooey that we see. Great. 
I have one more technical question. Um, Alan Gallimore wants to know, has the Microsoft, Microsoft Structures data layer been updated recently and how could that improve or affect movie mapping? And Ty, you're sharing the Slack screen. Ty, you're, you're sharing your personal computer. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you repeat that, Gloria? Has Microsoft Structures data layer been updated recently? And how could that improve or affect WUI mapping? Uh, yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, Microsoft Structure data, I think it came out in 2018 or 2019. So um, updated recently is all a matter of perspective. Um, so it's not going to capture, you know, the most recent growth, new development, but on average, we don't see more than one or 2% kind of new development on in any given year. So it, it's going to do a really good job capturing that existing housing stock. Um, you can take that as a starting point and you can, uh, you can look at, I guess, some new imagery um, and add those homes you missed or remove. Um, you can you can fix omission and commission errors uh, by uh, removing mistakes or adding ones you mix missed. Um, um, often counties like Larimer County, Boulder County, they maintain this data, you know, in in their jurisdiction. So, uh, so you can merge those two and kind of increase the accuracy of that. Um, I think this is really going to help our ability to map uh, the WUI. For a long time, we relied on census data because it's the best we had, but often those census blocks are fairly large and we don't know the precise location of individual homes. Understanding the precise location of individual homes um, um, is a benefit. It helps us map the WUI, helps us figure out what homes are at, at risk. And then there's other applications of that as as well, you can think of uh, the firefighter who um, who might really want to map when they're rolling out to a smoke, sizing up a fire, to understand, hey, I have a fire here. I want to know how many homes are um, over that next like a ridge line. That's that's going to determine what that fire response is, how many engines, uh, you know, where to send people. So, I think having the individual locations of homes. Um, will really transform our ability to understand where homes are at risk um, and then um, and then design those strategic responses in those different um, applications. Yeah, Wonderful. awesome question. Thank you, Alan. Do you have time, shall we go for one more question and then we'll just have to, some of these are more specific that the speakers can respond to later. Um, one more question. In, in your studies, since you, you assessed a lot of national level data for extreme fires and losses of 50 homes or, or more. Is there a, a community or a city in the country that is showing exemplary techniques uh, that would be set the bar for best management practices? Of course, we all know in fire ecology and wildfire management, it depends. But is there a place that's really getting this nailed down? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, one, I'm not super prepared to um, answer. I, I think there's a number of communities who, who, who are doing a good job. Um, but, th you know, that is something we, uh, we struggle with, you know, you know, getting um, a high percentage of the community to uh, you know, mitigate their property, do those def debt defensible space, home hardening work is really hard. You know, often we don't see more than 10 or 20 percent of of homes actually take adequate actions. You know, the, per, the percentage of homes that actually follow, uh, for instance, uh, the FireWise guidelines or uh, you know, guidelines set forth by uh, Colorado State Forest Service um, is fairly low. Um, while there are some communities who are starting to do a good job, I think, but by and large, our efforts are, um, are um, inadequate and we're gonna continue to see these sorts of, of, of fires um, and these home loss events. Unfortunately, fires like Camp Fire, fires like Cameron Peak Fire, um, you know, they're the new normal. Yeah. Let's and I, I threw my email in the chat. So if anyone has any follow-up questions, um, I could talk about the stuff all day long. That's right. And he does. And I do. <laughs> he does. So let's hope that this information can be archived. This will all be available 
on the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network channel, um, YouTube channel, which is posted in the chat. Just, just scroll up, I posted it earlier. Or please go to the Eventbrite uh, registration page. We are updating that continually with new links, new information, um, new instructions. Uh, please fill out the Google form if you need continuing education credits. And um, I think that's it. We'll be sure to get the chat record to the speakers. Uh, your poll responses are very useful. And uh, I'm going to thank you very much for joining us. I'll stop recording.